Hello, all of you who are out there attending by Zoom. This is a very special occasion today to welcome one of our faculty members and uh, associated department, the Department of Psychology and Brain Science at the U of L, and a faculty member who's uh, really made a big difference, not only here at the U of L, but across the United States and the world for his uh, pioneering research, which has been going on now for decades and has been really important in uh, looking at wellness. Uh, and now, uh, not recently, but really, I suppose, well, actually a couple of decades now, isn't it, Dr. Salmon, work on mindfulness, and particularly on movement and mindfulness, which I've found very helpful in my own life because I, I really have trouble just sitting still and, uh, and, and doing any kind of mindful work because uh, I seem to be always on the move unless I'm sitting down at a Zoom meeting like this or uh, having a session with a patient. I like to keep moving otherwise. Um, and personally, some of my, uh, I think my most mindful moments have been uh, when I was a runner and able to get into that's, that's whatever it was, some kind of a zone and be really with uh, the things that were around me. And uh, I remember once in, up in Ohio running at my sister's house through wheat field after wheat field and the wind was just rustling with the wheat a little bit and I just got into that just watching those that the wheat movement and uh it was a a, a mindful memory that is still with me but anyway uh, I want to get to the speaker now and to introduce Dr. Salmon um who uh, is from our department of psychology uh, he also has been very helpful in our work at the University of Louisville Depression Center, serves on our clinical advisory committee, and is, uh, is a personal friend of mine for many years. Uh, and in addition to all of his great work in, in psychology and, in, and, and research, uh, he's just a wonderful musician. Um, and I, I think that the combination of those things has is, is probably been uh, something that uh, sort of one informs the other. But. Dr. Salmon can tell us more about this. So welcome, Paul. I'm looking forward to the talk today and uh, it's time to get going. <clears throat> Thank you so much. And I just wanna do a check here to make sure my audio is working. Okay, video, are we good? We're good, sir. Yes, all right, fine. Um, so uh, uh, Dr. Wright, thank you so much for that uh, heartfelt introduction. And it's been such a pleasure to know and work with you for um, so many years uh, at the university. Um, and I can really uh, connect with what you said about the uh, importance of movement in so many ways, whether it's music and you're a wonderful musician too, I know, and uh, a runner, but uh, when you have such diversified skills and capabilities, all of them make use of movement in one way or another, which is one of our defining features as a species and something that I think really needs to be uh, honored. Uh, here is the uh, uh, welcoming uh, uh, announcement for this, uh, uh, from this, for this webinar. Just uh, they asked me to put it up here for a couple of minutes. So everybody can see it. A couple of seconds, I think they said nine minutes. So I'm gonna go from here to the actual presentation itself and um, going to start. And just please give me any feedback if you discover anything that I need to change or do. But at this point, the title slide should be visible and my voice should be audible. So uh, I'm, I'm gonna go ahead and proceed. So the title of this talk, Mindful Movement in Psychotherapy, a Destination and a Bridge to Healthy Physical Activity. Uh, I've spent, uh, just, just a note here, I've spent several years now kind of collecting uh, a variety of credentials because I really haven't been able to find any single discipline uh, academic discipline or clinical discipline that pulls all of these things together. So uh, I've explored credentialing with the American College of Sports Medicine, Yoga Alliance, the Roadrunners Club of America, uh, the YMCA, uh, mindfulness-based stress reduction and so forth. So 
<clears throat> maybe one of the things that we could be thinking about is how to unify uh, the skills that you can acquire in these many areas. <clears throat> Goals for the presentation, I'd like to describe the connection between mindfulness and movement. Uh, secondly, talk about how simple non-technical movements can be implemented in session to foster mind-body integration and also encourage motivation to be physically active. Uh, I wanna bring up the concept of embodied awareness and just talk about that in terms of working with clients in a culturally sensitive manner. And then finally, I'll give you some examples of simple movement sequences that we can all uh, implement in, in our work with clients uh, without necessarily being personal trainers or certified yoga teachers. Um, you know, there's so many things that we can do because of our intrinsic capacity for movement. Uh, most of what's in this presentation today is based on this on the, on the recent book. It's called Mindful Movement in Psychotherapy. And any, any sort of work like this obviously is dependent on the goodwill and the support of many, many people. Um, and I'd like to publish uh, publicly acknowledge the support and assistance of John Kabat Zinn, Susan Matarese, Brand Rogers. Susan is my partner, my wife, who has uh, put up with all of my machinations about movement for many, many years. Brant Rogers, a wonderful yoga teacher who helped form the basis for this book. Uh, Randy Schrode and Jess have been so inviting and so supportive of mindfulness as a valid clinical intervention. Uh, Sandy Sefton was my co-author on many of the studies that we've published on mindfulness. Uh, Bernadette Walter is the director of the Psychological Services Center, who has also been highly supportive. And there are many other people that I um, haven't mentioned, but this has been really a collective uh, enterprise. Three interdependent themes comprise this book. One is movement is vital to health. Secondly, for so many people who are sedentary, which is basically the majority of our population, the transition from being sedentary to active is challenging. And from the standpoint, what I would say, open-hearted, non-judgmental awareness of the body in motion and movement can facilitate this transition. So uh, there's a wonderful quote by Jack Lan, who maybe some of you remember, I certainly do remember, he had a TV show that went from 1951 to 1985. Uh, what he said was, people don't die of old age, they die of inactivity. And I really, in some ways, couldn't agree more with that. And, and his ideas really, in many ways, have been borne out over the years. So on the other hand, how do you become active if you're not used to being active? Uh, Dina Castor is an Olympic uh, long distance runner. And, and, and I think she said this very well. She said, well, if you stay in your comfort zone, you're not going to do anything special. It takes a little effort to get up and and, and move. So then we come to uh, Flojo Joyner. She was an Olympic runner. And uh, here's her quote, you were born to run. So we were born to move. There's no doubt about that. And I think that's something that's often overlooked when people talk about exercise. It's like something that's imposed on you rather than something you have a capacity for. So speaking of being born to run, uh, I just wanna share with you this uh, slide uh, based, uh, which kind of summarizes our evolutionary ancestry, uh, showing in fact that we are made to move. It says, as it says, humans are unique among primates in their ability to run long distances. There's a um, evolutionary biologist at Harvard, Daniel Lieberman, whose book Exercised, why something we never evolved to do is healthy and rewarding. Um, takes a close look. And, and he's actually also a runner. He's run the Boston Marathon several times. Um, and, but as you can see on the right here, just a number of structural elements that are designed to uh, reinforce our capacity, not just for walking, but for running, which may have preceded walking as a vital survival skill, because after all, you've got to hunt. So uh, nuchal ligament, high density slow twitch fibers, sweat glands, we don't have fur, 
we have a very large gluteal uh, muscle, which is propels us forward. Uh, my favorite one is the uh, nuchal uh, ligament, by the way, which here's a picture of it. It's the back, back of your neck. And it basically keeps your head from bobbing forward and backward when you're, when you're, when you're moving. And uh, it, it, if you've ever looked at uh, photographs of runners from the neck up, uh, many of them just, for some people, it's sort of like a forward and backward bobbing motion. But for many other runners, it's very, very smooth. And, and this particular ligament, which is not so necessary for walking, but it really does facilitate running. So we are basically made to run from an evolutionary standpoint. So I'm saying this gives us tremendous potential. Um, so uh, Daniel Lieberman, who I just mentioned, has a wonderful book. Uh, as I said, it's called Exercise. And I think it's in the bibliography and the references that I sent out. And um, so he has uh, taken to um, criticizing a number of sort of aphorisms that uh, people like to spout out. For example, sitting is intrinsically health, uh, unhealthy. No, it's not. It, it, it's okay to sit, but you've got to intersperse sitting with movement, for example. This most controversial one, we evolved to exercise. Here's what he means by that. What he's saying is that we evolved to be physically active and to move. However, we did not evolve in a way that made us, um, that facilitated, for example, using elliptical trainers or stair masters or treadmills or being in gyms. I mean, our evolutionary history had us out in the real world, uh, foraging for food, hunting, avoiding predators and so forth. So exercise is kind of a, a, a weird thing in a way. We've come up with current formulations of it, but uh, realistically, the kind of movements we were made for are very different. Here's, I think you'll, you'll love this um, slide. I'm sure this is a picture of the original treadmill or tread wheel, um, and it was called an atonement machine. And this is a, uh, this is used in, in prisons in uh, London, England and other places to, to, uh, for prisoners. And actually it's kind of like a tread wheel that was hooked up to a grindstone where they could use to process flour um, for the, for the prison um, kitchens. But you see the idea here of our origins in terms of some of the machinery that we use today has its uh, heritage as a punitive device. So just keep that in mind when you're, uh, you know, the next time you're on the treadmill and sweating and saying, gosh, I wish I could get through this. This is so boring and, uh, and so forth. So, you know, we can do better than that. Not, I mean, treadmills are okay, but uh, just, just don't get too connected to them. That's all. So here, and, and here's another great photograph. Uh, in the uh, 19th century, um, there was a whole movement, cultural movement in Europe um, and in the United States towards developing uh, devices for uh, exercising. So exercise became highly formulated. There was a Swedish physician, his name was Gustav Zander, and he's, uh, these are photographs of some of the machines that he uh, designed. I don't know if my, um, my laser pointer will work. I'm pointing it. I don't know if you can see, but if you look at the slide on the upper left, here's a guy sitting in a chair with his feet up against a revolving wheel, which is stimulating the soles of his feet. And, um, and then at the uh, bottom center, oops, sorry about that, the woman who is using a, a kind of contraption to sort of help reinforce good posture. And then the one on the right, this guy is standing, uh, and, and those are like boxing gloves that are pummeling his abdomen as a way of um, improving his strength. So, but my point here is simply to say that exercise became highly formalized and structured and eventually medicalized and so forth. No wonder people don't like to exercise. I mean, here are some of this, is, these are some quotes from the book um, initiating activity. I'm not used to doing this. I'm sure I won't like it. Uh, and somebody else said, I started walk, a walking program, but I'm not getting anything out of it and I'm ready to quit after one or two sessions. Uh, unless I push myself, I feel there's no point in being active. So, um, so 
I mean, what, what are the options here? There's a wonderful, this, this is so interesting, a guy named Sanford Bennett, who was part of this movement in the uh, early, late 19th century, early 20th century, exercising uh, ideas and programs. He wrote a book called Exercising in Bed. So you can, you can look that up uh, online. That would be one way to approach, approach this, but we really do want to get uh, people to be more active. Mark Twain was interviewed um, in a, there was an interview in Sweden where uh, he, they were talking about physical ac activity and he had a wonderful quote. Uh, he said, somebody asked him, well, what do you think about osteopathic uh, medicine and, and manipulation of the body. And he said, I think it's a, it's vigorous exercise and other people do it for you. Isn't that nice? So this kind of passive approach is something that we, uh, we, we don't want to, to uh, advocate um, too much. We want to figure out how to tap into people's intrinsic capacity. I, I'm, I'm not going to take much time of it. This is a fairly lengthy narrative from the book, but um, this is where this is a client who I was talking with after several weeks of the mindfulness program. I said, you know, hey, I, I notice you're doing a lot with the body scan, uh, noticing, be, turning your attention inwardly. And they have this wonderful response. He said, yeah, it's helpful. At least I'm not so quick to say I'm fine without pausing to see what's going on inside. But then a little further down, do you see where I, I proposed? Well, let's see if we can go from the body scan to actually moving a little bit. The first thing they say, is this like exercise? No, oh, I'm so tired all the time. So the word exercise, I think for many people has negative um, connotations. And George Sheehan, the cardiologist uh, and, and writer who's written several books on running so forth. Exercise is done against one's wishes and maintained only because the alternative is worse. That's an attitude that, that a lot of people seem to have. Okay, here's a counterpoint to that. If you are losing your faith in human nature, go out and watch a marathon. Catherine Switzer, who was the first woman to run officially as a woman, run the Boston Marathon back in 1967. She started the um, 267 Foundation, which was her number. This is an iconic photograph, a three-frame photograph of the, uh, the, the this weird kind of coming together of so many things. She happened to be just outside of uh, near, near Framingham, Massachusetts. The press truck pulled up. She had registered it as Kay Switzer. The race director was in the truck, noticed her and realized, oh my gosh, there's a woman running in, in my race. And he jumped off the truck and, and accosted her as you can see. And um, her boyfriend at the time uh, gave him a good shoulder bump. And uh, that was the end of it. She finished the race. And then a couple of years later, she went on when women eventually were, were you know, kind of brought into the, to all the races. And now, interestingly enough, there are more women than men that participate in long distance races. So uh, Catherine Switzer was a wonderful pioneer in that regard. So, what is mindful movement? What are we talking about here? So for, for John Kapitzin, we start with mindfulness. Mindfulness is the awareness that emerges through paying attention on purpose in the present moment and non-judgmentally to the unfolding of experience moment by moment. This is an iconic uh, definition that's cited over and over again in the, in the literature. I kind of piggybacked on that to come up with my own idea here. First of all, what do we mean by movement? And that's normally defined as either overt or covert musculoskeletal activity, simple enough. Mindful movement, process of bringing sustained attention to intentional physical actions on a moment by moment basis, also in a non-judgmental uh, uh, manner. So this is, um, this is where I'm, I'm coming from when I'm talking about the importance of not just moving, but moving with awareness. Of course, if you ever, if you do yoga, uh, certainly in many forms of yoga, the emphasis will be on moment by moment movement. But, but on the other hand, you can go to a yoga class and be totally mindless about it too, you know, kind of thinking about what you're gonna be doing afterwards and uh, you know, just not really paying attention to what's happening. 
So here's, um, I wanna lay out a problem for you uh, for which I think mindful movement is kind of an antidote. First of all, we know that chronic physical activity contributes to poor health, premature uh, mortality. Citations at the bottom are included in the uh, reference documents, so I, I don't think I need to um, go through them here. But we have epidemic levels of chronic disease, heart disease, diabetes, cancers, and so forth. The problem is that exercise recommendations are frequently ignored, and we have very low compliance in terms of long-term uh, uh, development. So, uh, you know, what, what's interesting to me is how, how, why is it that that's the case, given our evolutionary history and our extraordinary capabilities to be physically active? I also feel like we tend to overlook the value of present moment oriented everyday movement. So from my standpoint, the link that I think needs to be made be between sedentary behavior and engaged activity is, sorry, there we are, mindful. What I'm calling mindful movement, M moving with awareness is a simple way to um, characterize it. So it's not just moving, but are you aware of moving? Just like breathing, one of the uh, classic patterns, uh, mindfulness practices that you start with is awareness of the breath. So what are you aware of as you breathe? What are you aware of as you move? Um, I would like to pause here for just a moment. And um, I think I'm going to try this. I believe I can uh, momentarily black the screen just for a second or two. And I'd like to share a brief reflection with you, kind of a pause and reflect. How well can you focus attention? It probably depends on what you're doing, for one thing. What about physical activity? If you exercise, do you pay attention to what you're doing? Or do you prefer to listen to music, daydream, or think about other things? If the latter, you're not alone. For many people, exercise is a burden rather than a source of enjoyment. I hope through this presentation, you may develop a new attitude toward being physically active based on discovering that there can be great pleasure in being active when your attention is focused in the moment rather than on long-term goals like losing weight or getting in shape. So take a moment right now and move. Just do, do something. I mean, you can kind of take an arm, one arm up, move it around a little bit, take the other arm up, move it, take your, interlace your fingers, extend your hands out. And, and, but do that with just as, you, as if you were observing the breath, uh, be aware of the movement. We have all of these receptors, proprioceptive receptors that give us feedback as to what's happening. So that when you move, for example, stretching and so forth, even if you close your eyes, you still have a very refined sense of spatial um, elements and can tell exactly where each limb is positioned. So there, there's a wealth of exploratory uh, opportunities here to, to, to really take advantage of and, and teach um, clients. Oh, good. Okay, we're back. So continuing on. Mindful movement in psychotherapy. So I've listed a number of uh, of factors here that I feel really should be emphasized. First of all, uh, movement is such a powerful mode of interpersonal communication. I, I put that first because you know, we don't, when, when we talk about talk therapy, uh, it's always embedded in a context of movement. Now with COVID and going online and so forth, even if you're doing video based uh, therapy, you're still missing out on many of the nuances that come from sitting in the presence of another person and you know, kind of moving, gesturing and so forth. People mirror each other's behavior. So movement is, is vital here. Uh, as, as a therapist, as a person, you can embody a healthy behavior. You can, you can express uh, gratitude 
uh, for being able to move for this incredible capacity that we have. A colleague of mine, Rich Lewine, um, uh, uh, circulated a, an email just the other day uh, in which he was talking about, and I don't want to get into the controversy here, but there's a uh, Tom Insel's book, Healing, Our Path from Mental Illness to Mental Health, has generated a lot of controversy in terms of the the extent to which the traditional medical model does not seem to be especially helpful in the realm of psychological issues. But this one of the things that stimulated brought it is that it brought back to memory a quote from Aaron Beck when he was here at U of L to accept the Grawmeyer Award uh, years, years ago. And here's what he said. I think this is important. Just to, I want to point this out. The major force and the therapeutic process appears to have been the emotional experience between patient and therapist. He was, th this is a quote from 1952, 70 years ago. He's commenting on research on treating severe mental illness, uh, schizophrenia. So he went on to say, important components in the therapist's attitude were a strong liking for and interest in the patient no fixed system of therapeutic techniques was employed other than an attempt to perceive the patient's needs and to deal with them in a flexible way. So uh, I, I think these are words worth remembering that, that the relational quality is what really matters. So when we talk about movement, uh, you, you can go to a physical therapist or uh, you know, kind of uh, go to the gym, work with a trainer and so forth. My feeling is that if there's not a fundamental uh, strong relationship that's formed, it's not so likely that the outcome of that will be as um, effective as it otherwise could be. So there are other elements here. Movement diminishes physiological activation and reduces stress. I'm sure we know, we all know, the benefits, it's just a matter of how do we get people, how do we encourage people to become more active? Five ways that I've talked about in the book. Number one, recommend that clients be active. Sure, everybody does that routinely. The American College of Sports Medicine has as their mantra, exercise is medicine. I have, I don't know what thoughts about that, but I mean, I, I know they're trying to be helpful here and say that, uh, you really want to encourage patients to be active. Make time and sessions to explore potential benefits and barriers. So talk about it. Don't just send somebody off and say, you know, go walk or go run or join a gym. You can provide uh, clients with um, exercise specific recommendations. And um, yes, that's, that can be very helpful. Uh, there is a, a couple of wonderful books, uh, one by Otto and Smiths. Uh, it's a cognitive behavioral approach to working, to encouraging uh, activity. You can incorporate exercise directly into therapy. Uh, Kate Hayes is a woman psychologist who wrote a book um, about 20 years ago in which she would actually go out running or walking or whatever, at working out with her clients. I don't think it really caught on, but I mean, I sort of understand her uh, interest and motivation. And then we have mindful movement, which is much more low key. These are things you can do in session without a lot of training and without getting into aerobic conditioning or anything like that. So I do want to point out that the major mindfulness-based interventions, MBIs as they're referred to, pretty much without exception, incorporate movement in one way or another. Mindfulness-based stress reduction is the uh, progenitor of all of these others. This is the one that Kabat-Zinn started back in the 1970s, uh, really a long time ago. And now we have mindfulness-based cognitive therapy, cancer recovery, relapse prevention. And then in the area of domain of sports and athletics, we have mindfulness acceptance commitment-based performance enhancement. And then uh, very recently, Mindful Sport Performance enhancement, enhancement by Keith Kaufman and Carol Glass and colleagues. And this has really made an impact in terms of work with athletes um, and, and, and others in, um, in sports related areas. So uh, the, um, and I want to uh, share a quote here really um, from 
a book uh, on mindfulness-based cognitive therapy for depression, uh, which I really think captures in many ways the essence and the essential features of the value of movement. And, and in, as you probably know, MBSR incorporated yoga as the main form of movement. Not that there was anything, you know, kind of especially revolutionary about yoga. John happened to enjoy doing yoga. And one of the points that I want to make here is that when people say to me, so what's the best exercise? One that you'll do. And, you know, I, as, as opposed to thinking, oh, you should be doing this or should be doing that. So he incorporated L uh, yoga into the mindfulness-based stress reduction program. It's one of three core components. The others are the body scan, which is kind of like he described it as a kind of a Greyhound bus tour through the body with moment by moment uh, awareness and then sitting meditation. I think it was revolutionary because very few uh, advocates of complementary medicine, of psychology in particular, were, were venturing into the movement domain. And I think there were territorial issues that kind of uh, contributed to that. But the, this, this, this quote really is, is very important. The, the point of the stretches and yoga, and you could just substitute movement, is to provide a direct way to connect with awareness of the body. The body is a place where emotions often get expressed under the surface and without our awareness. As such, it gives us an additional place from which to stand and look at our thoughts. So we're not proposing uh, an alternative to focusing on, cogn on cognition's thoughts. We're just saying there's an interaction between thoughts and um, behavior. So I'm gonna pause here momentarily and just share a reflection. Sorry. Do you associate mindfulness primarily with the mind? If so, you may be overlooking the fundamental importance of the body as an object of focused attention. Most meditation practices begin with awareness of the breath, not mental events. Can you focus on the physical sensations of breathing in and breathing out? How long can you do this before your attention wanders off? It takes patience and practice to develop a capacity for sustained attention of the breath or most anything else for that matter. Take a moment now, just sitting quietly here. <clears throat> uh, let the eyes close if that feels okay for you. If you're in a place, hopefully you're not listening to this podcast and driving. So, so if you are, please do not do this. Um, you could close your eyes and bring your attention to the fact that you're breathing. And find some aspect or some element of the breath that you could use as a focus of attention. It could be kind of the expanding and contracting of the belly as you breathe in and out. You may be able to feel air moving in, moving out, preferably if you can breathe through your nose because it warms and filters the air. But not only that, but it, you can hear and feel the turbulence of the air and then give, make that the focus of your, your attention as you breathe. Can you detect the moment when you shift from breathing in to breathing out? There's an interplay here between the sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system. Each controls half of the breath cycle. As you breathe in, your heart rate speeds up just a little bit. As you exhale, it slows down. So the breath becomes a wonderful focus for attention. Now, couple this with a, a, a larger movement and as you're breathing in, if you can do this, if you have space, you can take your arms out to the side, bring them up to shoulder level. And then on the out breath, lower down. 
And the next in breath, raise one arm overhead. Lower down the out breath. Raise the other arm, breathing in. Lower it down. Now bring your attention back to the outer world. And just, just to illustrate once again, how um, moving is a way of putting you in touch with vital aspects of how the body is functioning at any given moment. There's a term embodied awareness that I feel is important to mention. Um, and this is a, 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 a the, this is an article by a group of neuroscience, cognitive neuroscientists who talk about something called the inactive approach and basically making the argument that the way the nervous system is constructed and integrated that uh, there is a high degree of interaction between cognitive functions and physical capabilities. They say the body is a place where emotions often, sorry, the inactive approach postulates that human beings exist intrinsically as embodied beings. And that mental functions such as perception, cognition, and motivation cannot be fully understood without reference to the physical body as well as the environment in which they are experienced. So I think we have good uh, neurocognitive data now to say that, um, that incorporating, making movement a vital aspect of any sort of cognitive therapeutic activity is bound to be um, potentially very beneficial. I do wanna comment here in terms of uh, cultural factors. Uh, mindfulness has been criticized over the years for being kind of uh, a little insular and not really uh, making much headway in terms of uh, cultural uh, dissemination and so forth. And I think you can ask this about any mindfulness-based uh, interventions. Uh, for example, uh, we, we talk about the, the importance of alleviating suffering through mindfulness practice, but yeah, in a, as an umbrella term, that, that's, that's fine. But are these practices appropriate for diverse populations? And uh, how, when, when we think about incorporating mindfulness into clinical work, you know, to say, well, let's do sitting meditation or let's do yoga. Well, these are culturally bound uh, factors and elements. And, and even the, the concept of exercise itself is highly westernized. And I do wanna point out that uh, the predominance of the research literature on mindfulness uh, itself, and to some extent mindfulness and exercise is predominantly based on this, this weird acronym in terms of participants, Western, educated, industrialized, rich, and demo democratic. So we have to be a little bit careful about saying, oh, we've got this wonderful universal uh, uh, technique or practice that we can, uh, we can use pretty much anywhere, but actually the, the evidence at this point in terms of the breadth with which mindfulness applications are applicable it is kind of limited. And I think it's really important when we talk about, for example, exercise, well, it's basically, it's Western, it's industrialized, it's medicalized, it's religiously influenced and it's hyped by the media. So, so I think, you know, I think we have to be a little careful and just say, listen to this definition, voluntary physical activity that is planned, structured, repetitive, and undertaken to sustain or improve health and fitness. Well, that's not why, that's not just why I move. And I think for most of us, if we get into this notion of prescribing exercise, uh, I think we have to be careful about uh, in just not really being very sensitive to how um, how, how different views people have of movement and exercise. Here's a very nice uh, study that was published um, in, uh, in the journal Complementary Therapies in Clinical Practice that talked about not just for exercise, but mindfulness-based cultural adaptation guidelines. So for example, they, they broke this out into internal and external factors. And as you can see, if you just kind of scan the list of things, they, they, they certainly make sense. But then the question is, are you really putting these into practice? Are you respectful of cultural values? 
Uh, are you, do you understand the concept of interdependence and how prescribing somebody to do exercise and sending them off is not the same thing as saying, hey, you and I are gonna to work together in, in, a, in a mutually reinforcing way. Are you using culturally familiar terminology? Are you working within the, the values of the culture? The fact that the YMCA opened a new center in the West End of Louisville is wonderful, but I think what we have to do is say, okay, to what extent are the bricks and mortar elements of this kind of accompanied by sensitivity to values and attitudes and the, the lived experience of movement and exercise. I think by the way that they're doing a really, really excellent work there. And I think that that's a wonderful development. So just wanna to, want to point this out um, and uh, you know, just mention that we can look at um, uh, look at exercise from multiple standpoints, but I think we're better off using the term physical activity, you know, just simple and straightforward. So the uh, mindfulness, mindful movement in psychotherapy uh, is divided up into a number of chapters. And I just want to provide an over for you, overview for you of the different topics and the, the conditions. Having said something about cultural sensitivity, uh, we do cover quite a number of topics ranging from stress to addiction. It's not that there's extensive research linking mindfulness and movement in these areas, but you can find uh, evidence here and there uh, that, uh, that, that the, the situation is starting to change. Uh, for example, the work of Bessel van der Kolk uh, on trauma and movement in yoga is, uh, is a good example of how um, post-traumatic stress can be uh, treated effectively, not just by traditional cognitive uh, therapeutic techniques, but movement disorders as well. Even eating disorders is coming into the mindfulness um, realm at this point, even though many people will say, wait a minute, is an exercise one of the, over-exercise one of the major causes of, for example, anorexia? Well, there, there's a long, there's, there's a much more detailed story to this, but in any case, these are the, um, basic topics that uh, I talk about in the book. So fostering mindful movement, how do we do that? The foundation for me is the therapeutic alliance, start where you are. This was driven home to me uh, in, a, uh, in an interaction with uh, a client. <clears throat> I said, so let's pause for a moment and just let the breath come and go, okay? Response, I'm afraid I won't do it right. I might mess things up. So, you know, so even we're talking about something you're intrinsically doing, and yet people can be anxious about that. They're afraid of failure. So use what you have, teach what you know, start where you are, I think is always good advice. Stay in the present moment, keep things nice and simple. How are some ways you can do this? I like uh, actually a chair is a wonderful uh, device. It, it's uh, very, now, having said that, uh, Daniel Lieberman is very critical of chairs, which are a product of basically, I think it was the 18th century. Um, and, and, and in effect, what they've done is made it unnecessary for us to stand up and get down on the floor. So chairs are in a certain way can be helpful and therapeutic, but on the other hand, uh, you know, they, they take away an opportunity to practice what used to be a fundamental nature of movement, getting up and getting down, which is very challenging as I'll show you in a moment. What are the different things you can do? You can stand. You, so if you're sitting in a uh, chair right now, for example, um, why don't you just take a moment and maybe, and, and see what it's like. What is it like to come to standing? When we stand and sit so much, you know, just like you walk, just like you breathe, but we're not aware of what we're doing. How do you stand? So what I'm noticing here, I have my feet on the floor, they're about a distance apart. Now for me to come up, I have to lean forward kind of at, at the hips and I can use my hands or not, but that forward lean kind of propels me into an upright position. And then coming down again, so if you're, if you're looking for something to use as a mechanism for exploration, sitting, standing is a great one. It's very, it seems simple, but on the other hand, 
coming to standing works at least more more than a dozen major muscle groups in your body. It, it's a terrific workout. And I'm going to show you a slide here. Uh, you're, I'm sure you're aware of, if you've ever taken a yoga class, you've done Utkatasana, which is called the chair pose. So uh, Utkatasana is a fundamental, uh, involves this fundamental activity that we engage in when we're sitting and standing. So for example, here's a simple sequence that you could, you could practice. So you see this. And, and I've picked uh, images of people who are, you probably would say, you know, this is not somebody who's a, a runner or a, you know, a high powered athlete, but somebody who's sitting on the forward edge of the chair and notice the forward lean in the middle panel, they're coming forward. So this is where you really have to engage muscles of the back, the legs, shoulders, the hips, the head, the neck, the arms. And then you propel yourself up to standing. But simply doing that is a terrific um, exercise. And the other thing is, so here's that slide of uh, Utkatasana. Again, you can see in the middle frame how close this everyday movement approximates many of the elements of the uh, yoga, um, it's called the chair, the chair pose. So here's an example then that you could use or with a client and say, well, so let, let's investigate standing. How do you do this? Um, I was working with somebody recently and when I said, well, let, let's stand up for a moment. Um, they, they had their hands back and they said, well, I, I can't really stand very easily. And their back was, their back was actually behind their hips their arms were at their side and, and they tried to get up and they couldn't. And I said, well, look, let's play with this a little bit. So why don't you just kind of lean, try leaning forward and bring your arms just a little bit forward and, and then see what happens. And they came right up to standing and, and was like, well, yeah, okay. So we, we play with it until we figure out how to do things. And this is somebody who, who had a very negative view of their physical capabilities. Said, I can't even stand. It's painful and so forth. But once they explore the possibility, and, and actually also standing from a chair, you know, that, that facilitated this kind of movement was important. Notice the chair in this picture. Notice where this person is sitting. If you're sitting back on a couch and somebody says stand up, well, that's hard to do. But you, you start paying attention to all these myriad of details that uh, in one way or the other um, come into play when you're doing a mindful movement. Here's another example of a sequence that you could work with. Uh, for example, starting from a, a standing position, um, raise and lower your arms. Do this right now if, if, if you'd like. Um, and, and you could be seated to do it. I think I'll stay seated <clears throat> because otherwise I'll be out of the frame, but I'm gonna take my arms up to the side and then I turn my, my palms up just a little bit. Take a breath in, turn the palms down, lower the arms. Take the arms out in front, breathing in. Interlace my fingers, so forth, and lower them. <clears throat> it's very easy to generate sequences like this. This is what I mean to say. The other thing I think is very interesting about this is as you, like in a therapy session, if you were doing several of these movement patterns, over time, you're actually gonna create some physical fatigue. I mean, it, it, it's challenging to stand and sit and move, just like in progressive muscle relaxation. So physical, a sequence of physical movements, if you were to say to a client, well, you know, let, let's take five minutes or so, and let's just do some movement here and, and, and you know, get a sense of what's going on internally. The side benefit of that is that you're actually fatiguing muscle groups that will contribute to a sense of relaxation. This is one of the reasons that I feel that being physically active makes you feel better because you relax, you're fatiguing muscles. So major benefits. Um, these are examples of some recordings that I've included in the book. Uh, there are, I think, close to 30 but there are four to five minute little segments that people can use to focus on various aspects of movements. The one 
The ones on the left, directing attention inwardly, body awareness practice, body scan, tend to do, have, have more to do with awareness. But then as you can see, the latter ones, mindful walking, flexible stretching, seated leg raise, sitting, standing, and walking, um, are, you can do these as you follow along with, with the recordings or make up your own. Uh, I, I, I generate these all the time. There's so many interesting things you can do. I do wanna emphasize the importance of language and affect on motivation. This goes back to Aaron Beck's quote I mentioned earlier where he said, hey, you know, what's really important is your regard for your client, how you work with them, how you treat them. And I make a distinction between what I call prescriptive and facilitative language in regard to exercise and activity. So on the prescriptive side, exercise is medicine. Do three sets, 10 reps each, walk for 20 to 30 minutes. It's good for your health. Okay, but as we know, you know, how, how good are people at following through on prescriptions? I mean, we, adherence rates are really, really not all that high. And I think the same applies to, um, to uh, activity. On the facilitative side, here are things you can say, work, work these into your vocabulary, where you, if somebody does something, you know, they, they lift their arm up and, 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 and bring your hands together and you go, oh, that's cool, that's really amazing. What a remarkable capability it is to interlace your fingers. I mean, when you think about the, the neurological, the cognitive aspects, the muscular aspects of this movement, uh, what, a, what a wonderful thing we can do, right, with our hands. Uh, and other, other sorts of things. What are you aware of when you're doing something? What a great observation. So you wanna be upbeat, you wanna be really reinforcing of what people do. I love these, uh, these, these two images here. This is the, um, uh, this is the first actual treadmill. And as you know, now they're all motorized, but you can see from the expression on this guy's face, and it looks like he's really suffering here, but he, he was pushing along this elevated tread. That's kind of my image of what it means to have a prescriptive approach. So on the other hand, this facilitative approach, you remember when you could do stuff like this when you were a kid? Remember how you could like take your leg up behind your ear and so forth? And, and you would just do wonderful, invent on the spot, wonderful uh, behavior patterns that uh, you know, really are so intrinsically rewarding. I think we've kind of gotten away to that. It's not like we want people to necessarily do the so-called wheel uh, pose in yoga. I mean, it, some people can do it, but we want people to be more spontaneous and be willing to explore their natural capabilities. Um, quick illustration here of a client. Um, and what I want to focus on here is the dialogue, not so much exactly what we were doing. Our focus actually was on walking, but I want to, I want to emphasize the idea that uh, of the importance of a collaborative engagement. This is somebody who is a post-polio survivor uh, and, and was very reluctant to, uh, are we gonna do exercise? And I'm like, well, no, let, let's back that off a little bit. So let's begin by walking, taking our time and finding a pace that's comfortable for you. So it's, it's highly collaborative. It may take a while to discover, what is a comfortable pace, but that's okay. We don't need to rush. This is an experiment in just walking, an experiment in just walking, noticing when what you're doing feels natural. So you, you, have, to find, you have to figure this out and, and play with it. The client says, oh, I, I get out of breath so easily. It's like I start to panic just taking a few steps. Anxiety is here. We're just, you know, inviting a walking practice. And so we slow it down. You've given me an idea. Suppose we do some very slow walking together. You set the pace, not me. You set it. You decide. And let me know when you start to feel any sense of discomfort. That's the important thing. So it, it, it's a mutually conducted experiment in engaging in a behavior that most people would say, oh, well, that's just so simple and obvious, just, you're just walking. I ended up by saying, either way, we're bound to learn something of value. So I can't overemphasize the importance of the dialogue and the engagement that uh, accompanies this, this approach.
I, I want to end as we're finishing up here. I want to just make a point of saying that, um, that there's a very interesting article that appeared recently in the New York Times titled How Long Would It Keep Him From His Music? Joel Fram is a uh, music, he's a conductor for uh, the Broadway musical uh, company. And he was uh, in the first wave of COVID patients. Well, he was quite active, physically quite active. But if you can imagine, you know, as, you're, as a conductor, I mean, he was all over the place, constant movement. This completely knocked him out. Now, he, 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 did, he survived the early stages, but he turned out to be one of these long COVID patients. And one of the accompanying diagnoses for many of them is dysautonomia, which is a dysregulation of the autonomic nervous system. Ironically, a cardiologist initially prescribed high intensive aerobic activity and then put him on a beta blocker. He just got worse. He, he just could not handle this. And fortunately, he found his way to a center at Mount Sinai. It's called the Abilities Research Center. And basically what they've done is put him on a, on a, on a much scaled back program of physical activity that I would say is analogous to mindful movement. Very slow, deliberate practice with something called asymmetric breathing. They have a different name for it, but basically kind of like retraining the autonomic nervous system by lengthening the exhalation. I mentioned that earlier today. Uh, so like inhale on a count of three or four, exhale on a count of five or six. Pause here for just a moment and, and, and experiment with this. So, and once again, as long as you're not driving, you could close your eyes and take a breath in. And as you exhale, prolong the exhalation. And add some movement if you like. As you breathe in, maybe lift your arms. And then as you exhale, If you bring your lips close together, almost close your mouth, um, as you exhale, you'll hear a little air turbulence. And it, for me, it's a very relaxing sound, but you know, this is something that you could teach clients very easily. I, I think the technical name is pursed lip breathing, but, but with the addition of the prolonged exhalation. So this is one of the elements that they incorporated into his, um, treatment and eventually he was able to resume um, conducting a very dramatic return to action in November 2021. And um, it just, uh, what they said on the article, they said uh, he took 20 minutes to lie on the floor in his dressing room doing his prolonged exhalation breathing and listening to Aaron Copeland's Appalachian Spring. So, uh, you know, he just, he, he made his way back and just a good example of how much of what we was doing, I would characterize as mindful movement, slow, deliberate, moment by moment awareness. Um, I do want to mention that right now, uh, mindful activity, mindful movement is not part of the vernacular or the training, uh, as far as I know, in, in either psychiatry or um, psychology, uh, even though the American Psychological has, uh, Association has been a staunch um, uh, advocate here, but I, I would like to see uh, an expansion of clinical training to include courses and uh, practice movement-oriented courses. We, we talk about integrating mind-body movement, but honestly, I think we really could do a lot more to foster this in a, in a systematic way. And I think it would also help to reduce the territorial gap between psychotherapists and exercise professionals professionals. And a major bonus here is that I think utilizing movement will help facilitate enhancing cultural diversity and inclusivity. I mean, everybody moves, you know, whether it's dancing, whether it's running, jogging, uh, walking, you know, it, 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 this is a universal phenomenon that I think can, we can include in which we can include um, everyone. So recap quickly. Um, Hopefully I've been able to accomplish these aims, describing the connection between mindfulness and movement, explain how simple non-technical 
Movement patterns could be implemented in session. Talked a little bit about the concept of embodied uh, awareness and how you can bring that into work with clients. And then we've looked a little bit into some sequences of movements. And again, if you keep it simple, things that people do every day, uh, I think that's really the, uh, the key to this whole uh, approach. Uh, I, I don't know that we have time for this. I did have a, um, a little exercise. Uh, I, and maybe I'll send this out if, if anybody is interested, but where you could actually um, come up with a narrative. Uh, how, how would you do this in terms of you have a client that you'd like to work with? Um, first of all, figure out how, how would you present it? And secondly, what would you do? Map it out ahead of time. What I would recommend is as a focus in the movement of, on movement, something that you intrinsically do and enjoy and understand. So, you know, if it's going to be sitting and standing, practice it. If it's going to be walking, if it's going to be raising your arms, do it until it becomes not just something you do automatically, but you do with uh, awareness. So, thank you so much for your. Uh, kind attention. If anybody, if you're interested in following up with me, I'm uh, still affiliated, I'm affiliated with the Department of Psychological and Brain Science and also with the uh, Norton Commons YMCA. We're looking to um, take mindfulness and bring it into the realm of uh, systematic structured exercise. So thank you again. Thank you, Dr. Salmon. I think we already have a question on here. Um, so I'll read it out to you. This is from Davis Fleming. He's uh, uh, quite an avid runner and, and, uh, and, and a musician as well. And he's our, our PGY, one of our PGY twos. He <laughs> says, uh, thank you for such an interesting and insightful presentation. I am a musician myself and uh, found many music teachers and other practitioners taught the Alexander technique as an intervention to free the body, increase mm -hmm. the airflow and reduce anxiety or stage fright. Uh, I know this practice is used in athletes as well as musicians. Do you have any experience with the Alexander technique and, uh, and what overlaps you see with this technique and mindfulness and movement? And Dr. Caldell, if you want to add Dr. Uh, Fleming onto our panel, that way, if you can have any kind of additional comments he wants to make. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. That's, uh, that, that's a great question. No, I, I don't have any direct experience with it, but I'm well aware, and this is something that I talk about in the book of a number of techniques. The uh, Alexander technique um, is, is uh, Feldenkrais is, is another one, um, Pilates, uh, and, and you know, the, these are all practices that, that I think are potentially quite beneficial. It, for some, I don't really know why this is a case that they have never been more fully integrated into other elements of of healthcare. And my attitude as far as these go, you know, these practices go is to say, experiment until you find one that works for you. So in other words, the best, so-called best approach to mindful awareness is not to do, you know, this, this flavor that, that I'm talking about, but if Alexander Technique or Pilates works for you or Feldenkrais, I think these are all kind of have, have convergent aims in terms of enhancing awareness of the body. So, uh, you know, there's an interesting thing that I've, I've noticed um, in, in the context of, let's say yoga and uh, meditation, I, I've taught both. And I, I've heard people say, well, oh, okay, well I do, I do meditation, but I would never do yoga. And, and then the yogis will say, oh yeah, well, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm really into yoga and meditation. Why would I want to do that? And my, my attitude has been, why not do both? I mean, why, why limit yourself? And I think it would be a valuable sort of thing to experiment with different practices. And I wish we did more of that, uh, but you know, we're, it, sometimes it's hard to find practitioners. Uh, for example, like uh, Bikram uh, yoga has been patented now. And uh, you know, it's, it's sort of become exclusionary, but we're talking about human capabilities that uh, are, are just, are, are universal. Uh, Pilates, great, except you need, you know, fairly elaborate machines and you can only do it in a gym or a studio. It's expensive. So how can we connect people up with resources that are readily available that are, uh, you know, kind of taught by people with reputable qualifications and so forth. And, 
and, and reinforce this kind of exploration. But, but I, it's a wonderful question, I, and I'm very much in favor of exploring these, these forms. I, whatever you're doing, if you're doing it with awareness, I, you know, I think you can you can be you could do Pilates mindfully. You can do use the Alexander technique with focused awareness. That's what that's what's really critical here. Uh, as I said before, you could go through a yoga class and your mind could be a million miles away. Uh, I think what I'm adding here to the to the mix is to say, whatever it is, notice. You know, pay attention, learn to focus. Thank you for that question. I have a little quick comment if I can say something. Yes, sir. Well, first of all, thank you for coming. We've sort of heard about you for a long time. Thank you for coming. Great idea for us as well as the patients. That's pretty cool. Uh, one comment I have is, uh, even though maybe not so organized, what the exercise you do is a lot more important than the exercise you're supposed to do, but don't. Uh, for me, as a retired doc, I run one hour every single day. And if I miss a day, I got to make it up the next couple of days. Mm -hmm. But that has been wonderful for me. And if it's raining, I can do it in the basement. If it's nice, I can do it outside. You know, so the exercise you do is better than the one you wish you did, but didn't. I, I've always, not my standard response when people say, what should I do? Something you will do and, and something that you feel intrinsically dry. I think that's that's wonderful. That's incredible. Uh, discipline and uh, you know, I mean, and the fact that you're intrinsic, you're doing something you intrinsically enjoy, and and I mean, it's a tremendous boost as far as uh, when you think about the physical and the cognitive and the neurological uh, benefits of, of running. It's fabulous. Uh, if, so keep it up, keep it up. Maybe I'll see you out there one of these days. I I, I run too, but I now see this is interesting because I, I limit my running to three days a week. I I've, I've tried more, uh, it, it's, it doesn't work for me. So make, individualizing this is really critical in terms of saying, figure out what you can do, make it an ongoing experiment. And I think if you adopt that, that sort of inquisitive attitude towards it, you, you will find, you know, find what works for you. I've read so many, I've got stacks of books here on how to run, how to do this, how to do that. You know, I've, I've read them all, but out of that, I've had to kind of distill my own personalized approach to it. And that's what I think we could do. We could really help clients with and say, well, you know, here's, here's, here's what I do, but this, this may not be, you know, effective for you. So let's experiment and try to figure out over time with patients, what would be a, um, you know, a realistic way to proceed. So I, I'm curious how you got it start, started running like that and, and how it evolved to this point of an everyday behavior. Are you asking me? Yes. Uh -huh. Yeah, my internist, one uh, years ago, he said, why don't you run a, once or twice a week, just 10 or 15 minutes? And then the next time I said, I'm doing it, he said, well, wait a minute, how about 20 minutes? And he said 20 minutes, three times a week. And then when I retired, he said, now that you're retired, you can maybe do it four. And then each time I see him, it get bigger. And now I'm on my own and I do it every day, except... Uh -huh. I, like this weekend, I was out of town. I couldn't do it when I was on the plane, but but I did walk through the airport a couple of times. Sure, yeah, it's it, it's it's wonderful to see how these things grow. I've been teaching a, an online fitness class for primarily for runners, and most of us, you know, well into our seventies and so forth. And this fellow, um, the stimulus for him years ago was uh, he had chest pains and went into. Uh, nearby emergency care center and they said oh this sounds really serious we're going to put you on medication we don't want you to be physically active and he took the prescription home and i wouldn't recommend this to everybody but he said you know i just set it aside and, and he said i'm going to just start figuring this out on my own he's 75 now and um, he ended up running a a, 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 a marathon started doing marathons half marathons never had any further problems but you know the stimulus for him it was kind of a wake-up call they, they said you know here's something that could be a source of vulnerability and and he took it seriously but but then rather than going down the medication and you know medical treatment route he he started um, started started running 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 is great not for everyone but great example th thank you so much for that that comment everybody has an evolutionary history in terms of how they got into what they do and I think discovering that is, is, is really, it's a very, it can be a very exciting process. 
you know, just starting with, with, with simple movements and you know, one thing leads to another and pretty soon you're taking a yoga class and, and then you go on a yoga retreat and then you go to Cancun or someplace for, <laughs> for a week and, and then you become a certified yoga teacher. I mean, you know, it's just fascinating to see how people can really develop a, a positive kind of, I don't want to call it an obsession, but maybe it is a little bit, but you know, it's, 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 it's healthy. So great, great comments. Uh, well, I just have one follow-up question. Yeah, uh, sure. It's based to some extent on what Steve was saying, but uh, I've been thinking about that even before Steve came on board with this question. But I'm wondering, I, we all know about the importance of exercise and successful aging, but how about mindful movement and successful aging? Is, is there anything there that should encourage us to do this um, as a preventative or as, as many of us have a few years on us now to <laughs> well you know, yeah. have left. The, 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 the research that I, re I reviewed in the book um, tended to kind of we, we have the MD, the, the mindfulness research over here and then we have the exercise research over here and there, there there's only a very very slight kind of overlap at, 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 at this point I don't feel yet that there's enough um, mm -hmm. real uh, attention being paid to that. Everybody knows that exercise is beneficial, mindfulness. Is, um, but I mean, you, you could certainly design um, interesting, uh, simple studies here to, um, you know, kind of, for example, augment uh, traditional um, CBT with or without a, a, a movement based practice. And I, at one point, I even thought of a, um, a study where we would compare exercise per se, uh, just sort of done like you would in a gym, it's kind of prescriptive in nature with another condition in which people were asked to exercise <laughs> mindfully. So, you know, bring moment by moment attention to what you're doing. Uh, we, we never really got to the point where we, we, we undertook that, but, but I think you could some, to some extent uh, engage that, that element. I, I think as far as initial motivation, it's really helpful when people start paying attention to present moment experience, rather than focus on things like getting in shape, losing weight. I mean, th those are such remote long-term goals that they have very little relevance to present moment experience. And the fact of the matter is for many people, exercise doesn't feel good, especially when you start. You know, when you, when, when you hear people say, oh, exercise is wonderful. And, and like uh, Dr. Lippman was saying, oh, I run every day. Gosh, it sounds fantastic. And you go out and try it and you wind up in the emergency room, you know, because you haven't run in 30 years and, and it hurts and you ache and you're swe <laughs> sweating. And, the, and the, the, the lived experience of physical activity, especially in this prescriptive sort of model is, is often quite unpleasant. And, but, but that's your body's way of adapting to, uh, you know, kind of, a change in behavior. So when you start to say, well, yeah, a certain amount of uh, discomfort, yes, comes with the territory. But, um, but th that's where I think you have to be very patient and very careful with people and say, well, let's approach it just a, a little bit, bit at a time. I was actually was seeing somebody yesterday and teaching um, a, 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 it's called a squat position where you're, you're, you're kind of standing up and like you were skiing, getting ready to, to ski or get ready to be at the net in tennis. And they, it, it, took, it took us probably 15 minutes before we could even get to the point of saying, well, this involves hinging at the hips, hinging at your uh, knee a little bit. Um, but, but it was kind of, an, again, this idea of experimenting. So Jess, I think if, if uh, you know, protocol were, uh, an activity protocol were designed where you had that kind of close in moment by moment uh, attention. That, that's the kind of work I think that needs to be done. Yeah. I want to thank Dr. Lippman for putting most of the residents to shame with his exercise. <laughs> you know, one thing, uh, I ran a three mile race a few couple of months ago. The <laughs> winner was 18, was on a track team. His speed was four times shorter than mine, but mm -hmm. I was four times older. So maybe we were doing about the same. Um, there, there is actually, I had a wonderful uh, book on hand that I, it, it was basically about lifelong running. It was, it was uh, written by 
uh, a, a former editor of Runner's World, but basically saying that, and he has some um, charts that show the, the kind of detail out compensations that you can make for running at different ages at different paces. So for example, you're talking about a 10K or a 5K, you say, well, here's the average pace for somebody who's 18 versus 20 versus 50 or 60. So you can kind of gauge where, where, where you, if, if you're into data like that. Um, I thought that was a very useful um, way of looking at it. But uh, uh, yeah, here it is. I tell you what, it's okay. I can just hold it up here for a moment. Uh, it's called Train Smart. Run Forever, I think, is a little bit of a, an overstatement. But, <laughs> but uh, it, it's very well um, thought out. And it says how to become a fit and healthy lifelong runner. Basically, they, they had you, you know, work out mo most days of the week. But uh, in any case, as I said, there are tables here that give you kind of age related um, criteria for uh, comparing your performance. So highly recommended. We have about 10 minutes till our official time. Does anyone have any kind of uh, questions or comments? Anyone? Uh, we've got a hand raised. I think doc, uh, Dr. Caudill, can you add Dr. Wong to the panelists, please? I think he's got a uh, he's got a question for us here. Anyway, so yeah, I really enjoy your talk, Dr. Salman. So my question is, what's the importance of learning new skills, you know, through your lifetime? Uh, so whenever you learn a new skill, initially, you know, you sort of uh, depends on this uh, declarative memory. So you have to be conscious about your doing, trying to figure out, you know, that kind of thing. And then once you learn the skill, it become a non-declarative memory. And then so it's automatic. You don't have to think about it. It's a procedural. But on the other hand, you know, sort of does that apply to some sort of a psychological defense mechanism? So, you know, we, we have our own, you know, genetic culture, social backgrounds, and then we deal with the world in a certain way. And then sort of, you know, and then we sort of automatically, you know, unconsciously, you know, use our defense mechanism to deal with the society in a certain way. Yeah. And then is it beneficial to once in a while to, you know, use the, you know, sort of, yeah, declarative memory. I mean, you know, the, to, to, to be, to, to think about what we're doing, you know, that kind mm -hmm. of thing. Mm -hmm. uh, there, there's several parts, parts to your question. Um, let me let me just uh, take on a couple of them here. One is that uh, so I think there's an interesting contrast between skills that you learn early on in life, which establish certain habitual patterns of behavior that more or less get embedded and sometimes almost calcified. One of the things that I found with uh, people who are physically active later in life is that they, they con make constant reference to what they used to be able to do. And uh, yet, you know, maybe there's been a, a gap of 30 or 40 years. So they certainly have embedded traces or memories of early capabilities, but then the whole configuration of their body and mind really has, has changed over the years. And, and so it, it's almost like they don't recognize them themselves and they'll say, well, you know, I used to be able to run, you know, at a certain pace or whatever, or do this or do that. And, and now they, now they say, I can't do it. And so I think what, what that creates is an opportunity to say, well, let's, let's bring some kind of focused awareness, bring some of those non-conscious elements back more into awareness and, and just see where we are, pay a little more attention to how things are right now, take into account how things may have changed over the years. So it, it's sort of like taking a fresh look and if, if even something as simple as walking, I think there's value uh, in terms of immediate apprehension of the act of walking. So, you know, when you say to somebody, well, you know, walking is normally such a functional behavior. You walk to get from one place to another, but what if you were to walk just to focus on the experience and the movement this is, this is an experience that very few people have had. So sometimes I think what happens is that as far as memory um, factors are concerned, you, you sort of reactivate older memory traces, but then you embed them in a new kind of physical, physiological, even, even cognitive framework that gives them an element of novelty or you know, can stimulate curiosity. 
And, and I think that's preferable to, to a situation where people will say, well, I, I remember what I used to be able to do and I can't do it anymore, so I'm not gonna do anything. And, and so, so I, I, is that address, I hope that's addressing to some extent what you're asking about. You're, we're, we're talking about maybe re, reactivating, re-engaging in the present moment, um, images, engrams, schemata, whatever you wanna call them, that have been in place for many, many years, but looking at them with a fresh eye. Yes, yes, yeah, that's very helpful. All right, I think we're uh, approaching the end of our um, dedicated time here. Uh, a, a update for the rest of the month of April. So uh, for April, we have two grand rounds, one by me next uh, on the 7th, and one by Dr. Malik on the 14th. And then we have an m, &M at the end of the month. So that's for, for the attendees, the residents are present. That's our outlook for next uh, month. And uh, Dr. Salmon, uh, thank you so much for agreeing to do this. And uh, it was very informative, very educational. Uh, you know, we'd, we'd uh, uh, hope to talk to you more as, uh, you know, even into your retirement, I hope that you're still around to answer questions for residents and, uh, and faculty alike. I appreciate it. Thank you so much. Take care and be well. <laughs>